been speaking to my heart, uh, speaking to me quite strongly over the last month about the Holy Spirit. And every time I ask him a question, he gives me the same answer as press in, let the Holy Spirit seek, press in. Let the Holy Spirit, give the Holy Spirit opportunity. Uh, I've come to realize that uh, sometimes without realizing it, we have become numb to the, to, the, to, the, to the Holy Spirit. We've become numb in hearing Him, numb in walking with Him, numb in understanding Him, numb in giving Him preeminence in every situation. And God's been stirring my heart that He is the flame. He, he, is, the, he is the living life that we need to have in us. Uh, Jesus himself said, I'm going, but I'm sending you another meaning that we do need the Holy Spirit in our life. Uh, my message today is quite interesting. Uh, if you read the word be aware, uh, it sounds like a warning. And it may be a warning in a sense, but you notice it's two words, be aware. I think we have in some ways a long way to go to be more aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit in and through our lives. I, I think sometimes we're not even aware that He is in our lives. Sometimes we're not even aware that He is moving and doing something because we're so caught up and so uh, blocked up and so, so messed up that we don't get to see that the Holy Spirit is actually with us. And so I want to I want to talk to you a little bit about that today. I I I, I think that that um, we need to recognize also that God is the Bible says God says that the Holy Spirit is a down payment. The Holy Spirit's a down payment, which means that there is so much more that God will release, and you need the down payment in order to get the full thing. Amen. And so there is more in God, but. In this process, through this month, and, and going through all of this, I, I think if you haven't been asking this question, I don't know if you've been listening, but the question would be is, yeah, we talk about the fire, we talk about the flame, we talk about all of these things about the Holy Spirit, but what does that look like? How, how do we walk in that? How, how do we get to see this in operation in our lives? And I think God wanted me to talk about that today. And we're not going to drift away from the scripture we've been looking at for the last month because the answer is still there. I think to start off, if you want to know what it looks like for you to walk in the Holy Spirit the way that you need to do, you need to look at Jesus. You need to actually have a glimpse of Jesus. And I want to touch on that a little bit today. I want to talk about it today. The way Jesus lived, the way he walked, the way he flowed in his life, the capacity he had in his life, very much should be showing us, teaching us, revealing things to us about God. The Bible says he pleased the Father. You know, you look at Jesus' life, Holy Spirit has been involved from the beginning. We read that at his conception, the Holy Spirit was there. At his birth, the favor and the protection of God was all the way with them. Between the age of 3 and 12, we don't get much. And then at 12 years old, Jesus shows up preaching. And the Bible says he was preaching with authority. He was preaching with power, which means the Holy Spirit was with him. And then from the age of 12 to 30, we, we don't get much. And then at 30, we see him coming to John the Baptist. And the thing that's interesting to me is the age between 3 and 12, and then from 12 to, to 30, we don't get much. We don't hear much about what Jesus did. What did Jesus do? He lived. He walked, he talked, he lived. He did the things that normal people do. He, he existed in his life, Jesus lived amongst the people, but the people did not know it. The people did not realize that he was there. And I, I, I just want to sort of get you to see this picture because this is very important in where I'm going with this message. Can you imagine Jesus lives next to you? And Jesus shops at the same shop you shop. He walks the same street you walk. He goes to the same park you go to. He, he's pretty much part of the community that you're part of, but you just don't realize who he is. That's literally what was going on here. But then something powerful changed. Something significant happened. 
in a moment. I've been talking to you about where John the Baptist speaks about the one that he was going to baptize with water until repentance, but the one coming after him will baptize with Holy Spirit and with fire. And so we get to a place suddenly where something happened. John the Baptist sees Jesus. And we're going to pick that up here in Mark, uh, the, the Mark 1, the ninth uh, verse. And uh, this is what it says. It came to pass... In those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now look at the next two verses. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting, the word there is torn open, and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What an awesome thing. First of all, there's so much here, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to get it all out, but what an awesome thing to hear, you are my son in whom I'm well pleased. I was wondering what was God pleased about? Was he pleased about how Jesus lived up to this point? Was he pleased with Jesus being there? Was he pleased about what Jesus was about to do? I think it was all of the above. I think God was pleased with the fact that Jesus lived his life from birth to 30 sinless. I think God was pleased that Jesus, in obedience, even though he had not sinned, came to John, who baptized unto repentance, to stand in our place to be baptized. But I also think he was pleased that on that moment that Jesus came out of the water, he knew that Jesus would complete the task that he had come to do. And I think that pleased God. But the one thing that you have to see in the story that that will really shake you if you get what it means, the, the scripture here says, when Jesus came out of the water, the heavens parted. Now, when the Holy Spirit comes, it's always powerful. And we've looked at that now for the last month. The Holy Spirit, when he shows up, even when he tries to be quiet, he's powerful. You know, it's, it's, uh, I, my wife made me watch something the other day. What was it? Oh, Bumblebee. Anybody see it? It's a big robot thing. Anyway, and, and, and this, this Bumblebee is going through a furnished house trying not to bump things over. It's a big robot. Uh, you're not interested, but... But it was so funny because he tried not to bump things over, but he was just so big in that house, he couldn't but bump everything over. And so even when the Holy Spirit tries to show up quietly in our life, he tends to make a powerful entrance. So when Jesus came out of the water, the heavens parted. The angels were singing. That's the picture we get. That's the story we see in our Sunday school class. That's what we've heard all along. Uh, Somehow in that moment, it was a serene scene. Jesus came out of the water and beautiful music was playing in the background. And the clouds just opened up. And the sun shone down. And a dove, come on. This is what you all think it looked like. But what you need to realize is the same term that is used here is the same term that's used in Matthew 27, verse 51, which we have just seen in communion. That moment when Jesus said it's finished, that term when that veil was torn from top to bottom is the same term that was used when the sky was opened up. It's the same moment that the graves were pulled open, the the earth shook, that stones were literally torn in two. It's the same term used. Those clouds were ripped open. The prince of the air who had put a covering had no more authority because the power of God tore open. In fact, Hebrews 10 tells us, just as a side note, that the same way that the veil was torn, the body of Jesus Christ was torn for us. Ripped, violently torn. What does this mean? It means 
that the day the Holy Spirit came over Jesus' life, something significant happened. The separation, the ceiling, the cover, the thing that had separated him from having a direct relationship with God was ripped open completely. Now we can pray for closed cities and closed nations, but as a child of God, you can never pray for a closed heaven. Because in the moment that the presence of God came on Jesus, the heavens had to be ripped open so that there would be no separation between God and His Spirit. You want to tell me, with the Holy Spirit living in your life, that you can still live under a closed heaven? It's impossible. No demon, no devil can hinder God from speaking to himself. No condemnation equals no separation. Amen. Wow, Nico, that's quite heavy. God knows you're human. And he knows you can't do this. God knows you cannot do what you need to do. God knows you are not able, capable, or have the facility within yourself. You don't have enough strength, enough life, enough money. You just don't have enough in yourself to do what is required to live the Christian life the way it needs to be lived. God knows. This is not about you. This is not about what you can do. This is about what you should be doing by leaning into the Holy Spirit because God can do for a man what a man cannot do for himself. See, the devil will tell you, if you're stuck, try harder. Religion will tell you, oh, okay, well, why don't you work harder? But God said, no, I gave you my Holy Spirit for a reason. You know those... You, you've probably all been around somehow. Some of you are very grateful for the next thing I'm going to say. You know at the airports, you've got that, that walk, walking, what's it, the travel walkway? Travelator? How awesome is that thing? Pretty cool, eh? Do you realize some people still want to drag their suitcases behind them? Carry the kids drag it all along, there is a pavement that moves. <laughs> and then people go through all of that effort. And when you get to the gate, Ben, that stewardess or, or attendant doesn't say, oh, look how hard you work to get here. Well, we'll upgrade you to first class. Look how much effort you put in. We'll give you a front seat. Or he has a nice cool drink because you're sweaty. No, everybody gets there. How you get there is up to you. God gave you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is meant to make your life better and easier. And if you choose to walk in the Spirit, that's what he's there for. You can work hard. We all need to put in the effort to get there, but you don't have to do it all. What's the point? Nico, well, you, you, that's interesting, but what are you talking about? Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. He preached at 12, full of the Spirit. Why, in Mark 1, did he need to get baptized in the Spirit? Good question, isn't it? Because God knew that he was human. Come on, you need to hear me. God knew that he's human. The Bible says that Jesus emptied himself of his divinity in order to take on humanity. Jesus was a man just like you and I. Come on, look at John 1 verse 10 to 11. It says this, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Now, here's the thing. You know why they didn't? Here is the creator, the maker of heaven and earth, God Almighty, Jesus Christ. And they didn't know who he was. Because he didn't look like a God. 
He didn't look like he was some kind of a king or some kind of a soldier. He was just a man like you and I. He was born of a woman, flesh and blood, raised, went through his baby years, his toddler years, his teenage years. I don't know how he remained sin-free through those. But he went through all of it into a young adulthood as a man. He wasn't a robot. He wasn't an angel. He wasn't an alien from another planet. He was a man, just like you and I. There's a purpose and a reason here. And you need to get this. This will empower you in life. What Jesus did as the Son of Man is meant to show you and I what it looks like, what a man can do when they fully walk in the presence of God. Jesus is meant to be an example to us of what is possible for you and I when we fully walk with God. What is possible when we live sin free? What is possible when we're in relationship with God? Jesus was a man who lived on this earth. The things that I do and greater than these you will do, Jesus said. The same spirit that was in Jesus, the same spirit that raised him from the dead, now lives in you. Come on, my friends. There's something you need to get here. It's easy to see Jesus as God, but God needed to see us to see Jesus as a man. Because otherwise it would be impossible for us to do what Jesus did. We would pray for the sick and we wouldn't believe that they would recover. We would speak to the dead and we wouldn't believe that they would rise up. We would speak to the lepers and we wouldn't believe that they would be cleansed. We would look at demons and they'll scare us. But God wanted us to see that the same spirit that was in Jesus is in us. And if it was possible for Jesus to do this, it is absolutely possible for you too. John the Baptist was one of the only ones, in fact, in this space of Jesus' life, the only one who saw Jesus for who he really was. And that's why he said, I can't baptize you. Everybody else thought he was a guy just like us. In fact, they spoke about him like he was a guy. Just, oh, that carp, wasn't that Joseph's son, the carpenter? Maybe people talk to you today. Isn't that, isn't that Michelle, you know, the one down the, down the coast? Isn't that Lynn, you know, the one who lives up at Dromedary? Isn't that, they see us and we look human. God knows that's what we need to be. I want to say this to you, you need to be aware that he wants you to make a difference. He wants you to make a difference. He wants your life to make a difference in the world that you live. That's why it says in Ephesians 5.18, it says that we should be filled in the Spirit. Not topped up, not, not sprinkled over, not just a little bit here, a little bit there. But God wants us actually to be filled. How filled in the Spirit do you want to be? You get to decide. You see, you look at this bottle, it's full, isn't it? Now, you don't know if it's a trick question or not. <laughs> it appears to be full. But if you turn it this way, you can see it's not quite full. Because this bottle's contents is determined by this little thing here that says 600 mil. 600 mil is what it contains. But because it contains 600 mil doesn't mean it's full. It's only full when it overflows. Fullness is determined by overflow, not by capacity. And so many of us, we're stuck on the 600 mils. We're stuck at the level that we are willing to walk with God. I, I, I'll worship so much. I, I'll pray so much. I, I will walk so much. I, 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 will, I set some limits to how far I want. God doesn't want you to set limits. He wants you to overflow. 
And so we live in a space where God is willing to release the Holy Spirit and release, do, and release things in our life, but we need to step into it. I think of Jesus. You remember Jesus and the woman with the issue of blood, one of the favorite topics I preach about all the time. But here's the thing. When this woman reached down and she grabbed hold of Jesus', Jesus garment, Jesus didn't turn around and complain. She robbed me. She took my anointing. Now look, what am I going to do? I'm empty. Jesus never complained about the fact that she laid her hand on the hem of his garment. He said, I felt somebody open the tap in my life and I felt the overflow in my life. Fill me and overflow into her. Amen. Come on, I'm excited. Amen. We are meant to overflow. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. I was thinking about it like this, like those, you know those American restaurants? The Holy Spirit is free refills. Every time somebody touches your life, you should be getting a free refill in the Holy Spirit. Amen? We are meant to be rivers of living water. A river flows. A river doesn't stop. When a river stops, it's no longer a river. God wants us to walk in the full. Did you know there are diseases out there that are waiting to hear the name of Jesus Christ? I believe today, I, I didn't even think that so many people would respond to that stomach thing. But God knew exactly how many people were here today who needed a touch in that area. Come on. You are meant to overflow in the Spirit like Jesus overflowed in the Spirit. When we people touch you, they should be healed. When you come into people's presence, the peace of God should be there. You should literally be the presence of God in every place that you go. God wants you, and he doesn't want to leave you. God doesn't want a place in your life. You're not a hotel. God doesn't want to book a room Sunday mornings. God doesn't want to have custody of you on weekends. God wants to live fully and totally in your life. And part of the problem we have with a, the un, unfull bottle is that we try and book Jesus in when we have a vacancy. God doesn't want us to be a hotel. He wants us to be a habitation of the Holy Spirit. Now look at this here. Look at this. This is so good. And John 1 verse 32. Still the same story. But John sees it like this. He says, and John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it remained upon him. Well, that word is powerful. It remained. Interesting that as a man, Jesus still needed encounters with God. As a man, Jesus needed encounters with God. Right through his life, you hear the story. No matter how busy he was, no matter how many things was going on, how big the crowd was, or how many things he had to do, or what commitments he had, he found time to have encounters with God. He said, I'm going to pray. I'm going to separate myself. He always made time to be with the Father. And the Bible says, John says so clearly, and the dove remained. On Friday, as I was looking through this, preparing my message, you know what? I couldn't find any reference of any place where the dove ever left. No place where the Bible says that the presence of God ever left. Now, the verse says that it was like a dove. It wasn't a dove, but it was like a dove. And I think it's good to think about a dove. Doves are skittish. They're not... They're not very easily tamed. Like the seagull in front of my car this morning, I nearly had to run it over to, so I could get the parking spot. It was so stubborn, it didn't want to move. But a dove's not like that. A dove will fly at the smallest thing. Can you imagine how Jesus must have lived his life? How sensitive he must have been to the Holy Spirit? How carefully and circumspectly and intensively and in intentionally he lived that the Holy Spirit never left him. 
Now, I understand that the love of God is so powerful that even though the Holy Spirit is like a dove, God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But let's focus on the dove for a minute. Everything you say, everything you do, every place you go, every moment of your day, how would the Holy Spirit respond? You see, we think about how will the Holy Spirit respond when I'm worshiping in church? How will the Holy Spirit respond when I'm doing something nice for somebody? How would the Holy Spirit respond when I give an offering or when I do something? But what about the other times? Amen. What about the rest of your life? Jesus lived in such a way that the Holy Spirit remained with him, in him, through him. I think this is significant because the level at which you are prepared to overflow will determine the level at which you see revival in your life. Now, I, I'm going to be blunt with this because over this month, God's been speaking to me more and more directly. If you only want 600 mils, you're going to get 600 mils. But if your prayer has been, God, I want more, it's not going to come in 600 mils. It's got to come in the overflow because God's going to fill you up before he touches your life. God wants to fill you up before he does more in your life. It's not going to come at the expense of your overflow. Amen. Jesus said, when we pray, we should pray your kingdom come. That's a continuous statement. We should be praying that his kingdom would come in and through us into this world continuously. What does that look like for you? You see, we, we see child of God like a job description. It's never a job description. It's a relationship. We are a child of God. If God wanted us to be servants and slaves, then he wouldn't have set us free. But he adopted us as children so that we can walk in relationship. That dove is not going to respond to a taskmaster, but it will respond to a relationship. You can build a relationship with a dove and it will trust you and it will stay with you. But you can't beat it. It will fly away. God wants a relationship with you. He doesn't want you to have a job description. And this is the problem. The enemy would want you to think being a Christian is about doing all of this. But it's not. It's about leaning fully into him. And then all of these things becomes normal and natural to you. I tell you something. If you do the things of God as a job, they'll wear you out. But if you do the things of God because the Holy Spirit is overflowing in you, you'll never run out. Amen. And so our problem isn't with the Holy Spirit. Our problem is with ourselves. How full do you want to be? How much of the Holy Spirit do you want in your life? If even Jesus needed an encounter with God, then so do you. 